Okay. Your stream has ended. Why? No, it says live. It says live on the screen, so uh, probably really? we are okay, I hope. Okay, mine says you're not live yet. And the mine says live with the, like a oh. red spot on the top. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, live now. So now, I'll wait just a little bit more till we go 10 seconds to go. Now you can tell I work with TV. <laughs> Five, <laughs> four, three, two, <clears throat> one. Okay, so good evening to everybody who's viewing the session in the US and good morning to you all here in Asia. My name is Miki Abara. I'm a journalist with Japan's NHK World. First of all, I would like to say that we intently follow the war in Ukraine with heavy heart from Asia too, because of the sheer tragedies that are taking place at this minute. And also it's impacting not just Europe, but our region on many different levels. Now, our theme today is America in the new Asia. Asia has been undergoing tremendous transformation over the last few decades. Those changes are not just an economic growth, but social structural changes, technologies, innovation, finances, systems, you name it. Today's panelists are Asia's top drivers of those changes. Let me introduce them to you. Hong Kong-based Evan Iwan, Group President Animoka Brands, a blockchain games developer. Tokyo-based Kunihiko Shimada, CEO KS International Strategies, a global negotiator and an expert in environment strategies. Singapore-based Atul Temnikar, Executive Chairman, Global Schools Foundation, an expert in global education. And John West, the founder and executive director of the Asian Century Institute, which conducts research and analysis and specializes in policy dialogues focusing on Asia. Welcome everybody. So I would like to, first of all, give each one of you about six minutes for your initial remarks on how you are contributing to those changes in your respective fields, your outlook and how you see America's role in that moving forward. Uh, so Evan first. Okay, so um, uh, well, there are a lot of changes, obviously, uh, right now geopolitically, and uh, in terms of what we're what we're seeing is that uh, there is a uh, uh, we're based in Hong Kong, and you can see that there is a uh, there's an increasing divide between sort of this part of the world and uh, and uh, and and what's happening out in the West, and it's it's sort of uh, interesting from uh, my viewpoint here, um, uh, having grown up first twelve. Uh, years of my life in Hong Kong. Then I was in this, the U.S. for you know ten years, and uh, went back for MBA as well. So I'm very familiar with uh, the culture and and the press and all that. I went to also very liberal school. Went to Brown, and uh, so my thinking has been shaped a lot in the American way. Um, uh, in fact, coming back to Hong Kong uh, after I graduated from Brown. I would say that after, uh, uh, a degree of skepticism about what's going on in China and things like that, and the regime and all that. Then, of course, uh, through through my professional life, I learned about a lot about what what China is and how they they think about um, uh, you know uh, you know uh, creating societies. How do you actually have uh, harmony, more equality, more equity across? Then you sort of understand what it is. Now, this is two different, uh, very different political regimes, and uh, right now. 
the problem is that uh, Hong Kong sitting right here in terms of my uh, front row seat is that we're right caught in the middle right now mm. because we're supposed to bridge the east and the west. Uh, Hong Kong is a uh, uh, Western rule of law, uh, uh, free flow capital markets, whereas uh, China is not, the RMB is not convertible. And, uh, and it's uh, sort of its gateway sort of to uh, uh, capital raising is via Hong Kong. Mm. Now, protests and everything, national security law, the Western world has been very, very harsh to Hong Kong, but it's almost like a proxy fight uh, in, uh, in, in, in China, right? There are obviously hot wars going on right now, um, as you know, but it's almost proxy in, in that mm -hmm. sense. The problem right now in Asia is that this divide of this big power out in Asia, which is China, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the rest of the world led by the US, uh, the West, Western world, and it's sort of creating this uh, 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 huge sort of, um, shall we say, uh, uh, conflict uh, in terms of like uh, uh, having uh, countries choose sides. And that's really tearing things apart, right, in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And, uh, and, uh, and it really corners uh, China into much more self-sufficiency and a lot of innovation, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. are going to be more towards um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, more anti-U.S. rhetoric. So it's very, very hard to read. If you read a, um, a, a story covered, uh, same, uh, same stories being covered, you read it in Chinese versus reading in English or you go online, it's just so different. The angles are so different about mm. a certain topic right now, which is not healthy because it's almost like we're a post-truth world where you have to read many, many different things for you to get the right point of view. For what I do in terms of uh, blockchain in that space, uh, we're much more uh, catered to, uh, um, uh, you know, ex-China because China itself uh, banned cryptocurrency and also NFT is controlled in a, its own uh, digital um, uh, certificate. So uh, it's a permission-based blockchain. Uh, and for, for, for us to operate in Hong Kong, we have a free capitalist uh, system. Uh, uh, we have a lot of financial talent, uh, which underpins cryptocurrencies. And uh, because we also have creative talent underpins NFT. But uh, any mocha brands itself is actually headquartered out in Hong Kong. Uh, with, uh, but we only have, only have 100 out of the 600 people we have um, uh, globally. So we have uh, our next biggest footprint is actually in Argentina. Then we have U.S., we have Australia, we have you know, Europe, Eastern Europe as well in particular. Um, and uh, uh, so the way we look at it is that we want to see a connected world. We believe that uh, uh, ultimately what's happening uh, is that we would need greater collaboration or cooperation and the online world on the web three world really focuses on um, sort of how do we uh, how do we behave as global citizens so what's happening geopolitically actually uh, uh, sort of um, it's it's uh, we're, we're saddened by it okay thank you it would be interesting for us to discuss the divide between East and West. But uh, next is uh, Shimada-san. Okay. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, as the Miki-san already introduced me, uh, my name is Kunihiko Shimada, but I've been called a Kuni. And uh, I've been working as a peace mediator and a negotiator and also the uh, geopolitical risk analyst uh, to try to capture the, all the uh, kind of a conflict and economic incidents uh, around the world. And in relation to the Asia, uh, I had the chance to uh, mediate uh, in Sri Lanka and in the case in the southern parts of the uh, Thailand, and used to be called also like uh, the place East Timor and some other places. So I do have the very like a close heart. I mean, the, I feel very close to the Asian countries. And as the both of you have already said, the world is completely divided between the United States side and uh, China side. And I would say the Asia as a whole is a kind of a becomes the main battleground uh, for that divide in the world. Mm -hmm. And especially the so-called Asian countries or well, ASEAN countries are trying to take the keep the balances, keep the balance between the United States Europe side and also the Chinese economic divide, economic side. And I don't know where the, my country, Japan, is currently, but of course, it's uh, normally uh, we tend to be seen that we are closer to the United States, but the Asian countries and ASEAN countries are also very, uh, the, you know, important partner for the Japanese businesses and also like for the government. 
And as many of you already said, and the two of you already said, Asia has been recognized as the engine for economic growth and also social growth. And with the, uh, you know, the growing number of the highly educated, the skilled people, um, the Asia has attracted a lot of investments. And now, like, you know, the Asian countries, especially ASEAN people, try to, like, create and establish the original culture in the businesses and also, uh, you know, I was in economic activities and even the political one and uh, diplomacy, which also relates to the case in Myanmar, so-called Burma, because they try not to be, not to intervene so much uh, what has happened uh, in Burma, even though they keep, like, you know, the mutual um, non interference, uh, it's a diplomatically, but the uh, case there is always, uh, you know, the very worrisome, like the case happening currently in uh, Ukraine. So, uh, what I would like to see from the US role, I mean, the try to like the work with Asian people is, uh, you know, the first message was quite genuine, but as a general, they show the genuine interest in Asia and Asian people and also what the Asia is thinking about. So uh, that also means a genuine respect to the way the Asian people do businesses. And also they, they tend to like uh, in, interfere with the people, in, in, interact with the people. So like, you know, the, the one of the key messages I would like to uh, say to tell to the American colleagues would be uh, try to show the respect and genuine interest in Asia and also try to understand better what we are thinking. And rather than just imposing or just putting your own values uh, into the you know, how the things have to happen, so that's I think one of the messages I should like to keep doing it. And uh, like the Miki-san said, yeah, I also feel very deeply uh, sorry for those who are facing the situation in Ukraine. But also the Ukraine situation does have uh, the great uh, impact on. That the way we think and way we act in Asia. So probably, like you know, the in the discussions among us, I would like to touch upon these uh, issues in relation to Japan and also Ukraine, how the kind of global affairs should uh, should be formed, and how we can just you know to provide the good like, uh, will uh, to the world, try to avoid any kind of unnecessary device. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Atul, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone in the US and good morning to those from Asia and Europe. It gives me immense pleasure to be part of this dialogue amongst all the eminent dignitaries present here today. As TV debates and social media are raging on what is happening around one country, we are here to discuss a topic which is not just of global importance, but of immense relevance as well. We are here to discuss the future of U.S.-Asia relationship against the backdrop of a waning socioeconomic prowess of the U.S. It is undeniable that America is in a very critical stage of a new world order that is get created. The dollar is competing against the omnipresent yuan. Smaller regions are getting stronger by joining hands to pursue economic integration and public sentiment is changing in the face of continuation of America first policies by the Biden administration. What does that mean for the US Asia relationship? Before we explore that, we need to understand whether the US has indeed weakened over the last half century and the United States has dominated the world economics for most part of the post Cold War era. The globalization connected the world through the flow of goods, services, and manpower across the borders. But for the last decade or so, we are seeing a steady decrease in the U.S. preeminence in the world geopolitical and economic rankings on account of a number of reasons. It could have started with two unpopular wars after 9-11 attacks. Back then, America had given a world sentiment with claims of WMD and my way or the highway stance. Hope had come in the form of the Obama, Obama administration, but beyond the initial euphoria and brilliant speeches, its impact did not create any significant waves of change. And the election of Trump administration with its America first policies 
crafted to drive investments into the US, especially in manufacturing, openly saw the rest of the world getting restless. This was exacerbated by deficit spending, its geopolitical overreach, and its increasingly active stance to unilaterally decide on conflicts or to go solo on world affairs. At the end of the globe, an increasingly richer and assertive China was making a clear mark on the social economic landscape of the world. Even recently, America lost a major opportunity to step up to a world leadership role in fighting COVID and the void between the East and the West even got deeper. All this could paint a dark picture for America, but there is hope in the form of education sector. Education was most affected by the pandemic, which totally disrupted the status quo. The post-pandemic, the education world has changed dramatically. Especially when we look at the countries in Asia, where students have not been able to attend face-to-face -face classes on the campus for more than 24 months, and classrooms have morphed into virtual classrooms, and few of them are making it through the hybrid classes. But slowly the world is opening up. For example, students in countries like Philippines and India have recently joined back to school after a long gap. And a shift in paradigm, somewhat shift, seems to be beneficial for American education. How is that? Well, American universities have always acted like magnets for students across the globe looking at higher studies due to numerous factors such as academic excellence, innovation ecosystem, cultural diversity, etc. That pull of the American universities has become stronger for the brighter Asian students because of country's solid reputation offering research-driven higher education programs. As for the QS World Rankings 22, five of the top 10 universities and 26 of the top 10 university, top 100 universities are from the US. Moreover, US businesses put an emphasis on allowing international students who have American education credentials the ability to work in the US after they graduate. For Asian students, they feel the universities in the US give them a better competitive edge as compared to universities in other regions. So what is it that America can do to change the narrative? Well, one thing I can think of is respecting diversity and, and be more welcoming. Not to miss the fragmented or scattered nature of US education, which works as a boon for them as the student get the opportunity to explore various tools, technologies, curriculum, etc., and see what works best for them. Coming back to the US Asia Pacific ties, America still considers ASEAN as a prime destination for investments in the Indo Pacific region. According to a recent news published in the Financial Times, over the next two years, the GDP in Asia will rise faster than in the US or Europe, strengthening its position as the largest and the fastest growing economic bloc. It is expected to rise to 39 trillion in 2023, exceeding the 34 trillion for the Americas and 26 trillion for the Europe. America is still considered as the most preferred hotspot by the students applying for higher studies and professionals from seeking uh, opportunities from across the globe. So as per the estimate created by the U.S. Department of Commerce, in 2019, international students contributed $44 billion to the U.S. economy. That year, the amount of money the U.S. government spent to help COVID vaccines was almost equivalent to the amount incurred by Chinese students on the American education. However, given the U.S.-China tussle, there has been a varying interest among some Asian students to consider alternative destinations for their further studies. According to Common App, fewer Chinese students applied for American universities in 2021, representing a drop of 18% mm -hmm. compared with the previous year cycle. So the rising cost of US higher education, 
visa issues, delays, travel restrictions, increase in anti-Asian racism, and the rising tensions between the US and China are some of the key factors for drop in application numbers among aspiring students. However, there has been an overall increase in the number of international applications. There's a shift in the focus of recruiting students from other countries as well, acts as a boon for the United States. So in 2019, 2020 academic year, 35% of the international students seeking enrollments to the US originated from China, 18% from India and 5% from South Korea and 3% from Saudi Arabia. Though there has been a decline in the total number of Indian students pursuing an education, the US remains a favorite destination for studying abroad. As for ASEAN countries, there are approximately 60,000 students studying in the United States. As far as Singapore is concerned, there are 3,500 Singaporean students studying in the US. So given the fact that the US is losing its stance in the global arena for all social political reasons, however, it is unlikely to significantly impact its capital markets or chasing of the American dreams. And when we talk about position in the education sector, it is still the most preferred place for students looking to study abroad. Also considering the impact of the current crisis situation in Ukraine and other European wars, a lot of aspiring students would shift their focus from some European countries to the US. So in conclusion, the US and Asia will have their own issues ongoing, but the US continues to be positioned as a strong destination for higher education and shall remain so in the future for the next few decades. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, John, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mickey, and uh, I'm very happy to be on this panel with uh, all of my new friends. Uh, first point I'll make uh, is that uh, I come from Australia, uh, and I'm also a professor in Japan, and so uh, my comments will reflect uh, a perspective from Japan and from uh, Australia. So the new Asia, the new Asia of confidence is one where China has emerged as a very powerful country, and uh, India to a slightly lesser extent. Uh, China, of course, is the major trading partner for most countries in Asia, particularly for Australia and for, uh, for Japan. Um, but China has become very assertive uh, in its relationships with its trading partners. And in fact, China is employing economic coercion, punishing trading partners when those trading partners <coughs> do something that China doesn't like. In Japan, we saw that in 2011, when China restricted exports of rare earths to, uh, to, to Japan. And we've seen that more recently in Australia, where China has uh, basically sanctioned most Australia's exports to, to China, because Australia called for an independent inquiry into the origin of COVID. And so there's been a development of a, a lack of trust uh, in China, uh, on behalf of Australia, Japan, and many other Asian countries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have this strange situation where our biggest partner is a partner we don't trust. Mm -hmm. I think that lack of trust in China has been exacerbated through COVID because we see that China has not been transparent about the origin of COVID and the management of COVID. And that's probably even getting worse now. Now, on to America. America, of course, has been the uh, traditionally the security guarantor in Asia. I hope we maintain peace in Asia. Uh, America also traditionally was the major market for countries like Japan uh, and, for, uh, uh, and for China. But of course, with um, uh, particularly the rise of Mr. Trump, America became more isolationist vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the rest of Asia. Uh, America also uh, has become more protectionist. And mm. so the open market that America offered Asian countries uh, is less there. And in more recent times, of course, uh, in Asia, we've had the Trans-Pacific Partnership as one trade deal. And we've had the ASEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as another trade deal. And America is not part of either. Mm. So um, America has been isolationist and not participating in trade. 
So America also, particularly under Trump, has been perceived as a partner which is uh, unreliable, uh, less reliable than it used to be. And as one of the other speakers said, uh, when COVID happened as an event, we all expected that the US would be taking a traditional position as a global leader in managing this. And of course, the US has been nowhere. So US lack of reliability, lack of leadership, and more isolationist. Now, under Pro President Biden, there has been some adjustment in the US position. Uh, the US uh, under Biden uh, is more friendly to uh, allies like Australia, Japan, Korea, and so on. Um, it is trying to create a more balanced relationship with China, uh, forging friends with uh, Australia, Japan, India through the mm -hmm. Quad, uh, forging partnerships with ASEAN to act as a geopolitical balance with, uh, uh, with China. But I think Japan and Australia are still worried about how reliable the US is. And we're still disappointed that the US is not uh, participating in major trade agreements. And I'd like to just say a couple of words about the Ukraine situation. Of course, we're all deeply sorry about the suffering of the, mm -hmm. of the Ukrainian people. We're all shocked by what's happening, uh, uh, what Russia has done. And no one imagined that uh, a physical war like that would uh, take place in such a way in Europe. Because I think that in both Japan and Australia, we're trying to think about what this Ukrainian war means for ourselves and for China. And of course, we're looking at what lessons China might draw from Russia's actions in the Ukraine, uh, for one. And of course, uh, one lesson is that uh, uh, the war has not been quite as easy for Russia as Russia imagined. And as China is thinking maybe of invading Taiwan, maybe that would not be quite so easy. Uh, secondly, there is the issue of timing. You know, mm. people have discussed uh, whether uh, China might see this as a good time to take advantage. But uh, I, I, uh, I really wonder about that. And of course, we're all looking at the actions of America vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine. What lessons does that tell us about the US's reliability uh, in Asia? Mm. And of course, the US has been very active in trying to work together with NATO. Uh, the US has been very active in trying to help the Ukraine, but the US has not gone into Ukraine to fight Russia directly. And so uh, our Taiwanese friends particularly, I, I'm sure, are watching what the US has been doing and not been doing. But uh, you know, the lessons of uh, the Ukraine war, we'll be drawing these lessons probably for many years to come. But, uh, so they're my initial contacts. Thank you. So um, I would like to, I mean, we only have 20 minutes or so. Um, so I would like to focus on the divide uh, of the West and the East or, or US and China in particular, because we are all caught up in that uh, in a rivalry, yeah. we are in between, <clears throat> and we don't want this divide to go on or to deteriorate, right? And so I, I want to ask every one of you how, what we can do, uh, or what you hope the U.S. or China do in order to, uh, in order to, you know, in, in order for the relationship. Uh, not deteriorate anymore and and gap uh, you know cement the gap and be prosperous together what 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 we should do or what they should do um, can I ask uh, even first yeah um, I mean that's uh, obviously a complex topic in and of itself mm -hmm. right so um, the, uh, the 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 there's no way to go around it except for uh, uh, deeper understanding, right? So how how does that begin? Is that if you if you look at the dynamics of what went on, uh, starting with the uh, um, sort of the stepping up of of, ver of of the different leaders, right, with President Xi in China and with uh, President Trump uh, at the time, was when off uh, this sort of divide started, right? The rhetoric uh, on both sides uh, uh, did not foster understanding, 
right? Mm -hmm. And I would say that this is especially true in the America side from the angle of how I'm sitting here in Hong Kong, where all of a sudden everything is anti-China. There are strategy papers published about how uh, being anti-China is the Republican uh, election platform. Uh, And uh, and I also feel that uh, even during the uh, 2019-20 protests in Hong Kong, uh, the uh, us on the ground here believe that the press in the Western world are unfairly uh, uh, covering uh, Hong Kong. And uh, the South China Morning Post, which, uh, which tries to be much more neutral about the situation being a local paper here, really does seek to uh, see its balance. That's what I sort of, when you want to know about Hong Kong, read South China Morning Post, it seeks to be neutral. But again, if you read uh, papers on both sides covering a single issue about China or covering about U.S. stance on a certain issue, they're very, very different. So journalism itself, the quality itself has deteriorated drastically. I've been very, very disappointed with New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Uh, I've read both papers uh, uh, since I was quite young. Mm-hmm. And now I think everything, not everything, I shouldn't say that, a lot of, a lot of the editorial uh, that's been covering um, uh, uh, this part of the world, being in China in particular, are just one-sided. There's no, uh, there's a lack of uh, seeking of understanding uh, overall. A lot of, um, a lot of what this is, is political ideology. You have to understand, the West has to understand why China is doing what it is doing why it contains COVID that way, why it seems to be, you know, so heavy handed on a lot of things that it does. It, it really needs to be a sought and a point of understanding. China, on the other hand, needs to understand that, you know, there are certain systems in Western democracies that value itself as ideological on freedom of speech, uh, freedom, you know, um, uh, uh, about uh, human rights, et cetera. That is really much more about the individual, right? So these are not inherently incompatible, incompatible systems, right? These uh, they, the, the countries can still uh, hold its own uh, different political systems and still collaborate, just like how we embrace diversity uh, everywhere in the world. And again, in the tech, uh, in the technology space, people you know go across uh, uh, divides uh, a lot, right? There's no there's no digital divide in that sense, mm-hmm. right? People in the digital world, in the tech world, collaborate with one another purely mm-hmm. on code, and they don't care who you are. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the 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 the, um, the sort of uh, the, the the common ground that we would seek and we would hope to uh, foster more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just a one uh, small question, you know, in 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 wartime. People used to rely on gold because they can bring it anywhere. Uh, the N- NFT that that you deal um, is that would that serve in the same way as gold used to? You think in the future? Well, it's uh, right now the markets are more correlated than they are not, right? So when the war happened, uh, Ethereum, uh, uh, Bitcoin, they all dropped. Most cryptocurrencies dropped, right? Mm. Uh, but once uh, uh, there is a bit more sort of a um, the, the situation seems to be sort of like, you know, has sort of transpired in a way that is, uh, seems to be more predictable. Although, of course, war is never predictable. Then, it, then, then the currencies of the, the tokens or the, or the, the cryptocurrencies have risen again. Um, so um, uh, gold is still the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the assets still flow in the gold, right? Because mm-hmm. it, is, it is how the financial system is. Right now, uh, the crypto and the NFT space is still uh, a bit uh, sort of early, right? So there are a lot of uh, financial uh, investors and speculators who would look at these assets in the way of placing their money. Um, but ultimately, in terms of the development of NFT itself, it's unhampered by, uh, by uh, these, uh, these developments at this point. Thank you. Shimada-san, how to bridge the gap? Well, first of all, I will say maybe we should be careful when we say that can be completely divided between the United States and China. It depends upon where we looked at. First of all, like if we look at diplomatic side or maybe policy side between the governments, definitely yes. And the, that, create, that, that situation was created at the Obama time already. So that's why since then the U.S.-China divide already had happened. Uh, with the view from the United States side is that now the China is the direct target or direct like a rival uh, in the international politics. But if we look at the business side, the answer is quite vague. Somehow maybe yes, but actually I would say 
due to the uh, already like in a heightened interdependence uh, among the firms and also uh, two countries and also in the global markets. Businesses are not necessarily divided completely like the policies on diplomacy because uh, they need to, uh, I mean, it becomes the, the largest uh, trade partners. And uh, most of the, for some sectors, uh, actually rely upon the Chinese products as well as uh, from the food from the United States and so on. So that's why um, the one of the like a key, I would say, kind of a wish or will uh, remains in the business sector if the business people in both countries uh, have uh, sincere talks, mm -hmm. how they can just uh, bring the gap between two countries and also uh, try to manage the global market as it used to be like in, under the international cooperation. I think that's one of the keys to like bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. Question is also like, you know, the uh, in the level of the education, because, you know, the that issue is already raised by the Atul san And, uh, you know, there's still, as you said, the it's uh, China, uh, the, the United States is one of the key and the top direction for the Chinese uh, <coughs> food. As well as also, if I talk to the U.S. students, because I used to be here in the U.S. for long years, even being educated over there, um, I still like, uh, you know, to hear lots of stories. I mean, the U.S. young students are quite interested in learning uh, Chinese and they would like to know about what the Chinese are going to do and also their yeah, thinking. So in that sense, at the uh, kind of people's level, citizens level, uh, still there are not necessarily the huge gap are there. So they're mutually interested. But the question is, of course, our view is easily affected by the media and also this, the, also the government policies and direction. So we have to be careful. And maybe in relation to the some Ukrainian issue, that's also like give a lot of lessons to us, especially mm -hmm. like, and as the John mentioned, Mr. West mentioned, uh, reliability, reliability of the reliability of the United States in the case of the crisis is deteriorated, I have to say. And maybe I shouldn't say that the U.S. abandoned Ukraine, maybe, or maybe NATO abandoned Ukraine in the in the in the real term. But the, we are looking at the you know the kind of global responses from the to, to the Ukraine issues will decide or describe how the world will likely to react mm -hmm. when China takes uh, kind of massive aggressive actions towards Taiwan and other Asian countries. So in that sense, actually, maybe we, including the Japanese people, government, start to like uh, guess, will the United States really protect us as the United States used to, uh, you know, pro promise us? So that's also another thing to, to the U.S. colleagues, uh, you know, who are attending or listening to this session is uh, show actually like, you know, the, that the, you are supportive to the Asia as well. You're caring about what the Asians do and also especially Maybe I think that you are the last resort protector of the uh, Asia um, kind of security. So that's probably that kind of attitude needs to be uh, clarified and also showed very clearly uh, to the Asian people. So probably that's, I think, the way to bridge the gap uh, between the U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. Can I go to you, John, first uh, about, you know, what, what do you see the security situation going forward in Asian countries? You know, after this Ukraine, of course, we don't know what what will happen in Ukraine, but um, what will be the likely scenarios? I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit pessimistic about the the situation between the U.S. and uh, China in the sense that um, President Xi has made clear that he wants to kick the U.S. out of Asia, uh, and he's made it clear that he wants to take over Taiwan, even though the Taiwanese people don't want to do that. So with those fundamental points, it's very hard to have a stable situation. Mm. And also, uh, you know, China has been interfering in uh, domestic society, in politics, in Australia, in other countries, and that's very clear. And it's hard to sort of see, um, you know, a good situation in the future while we have China is an authoritarian government and uh, other governments being democratic. I think um, um, on the US side, a big problem, I think, is lack of understanding of Asia. And we have that in Australia, too. You know, we call it Asian literacy or Asian competence. You know, most Australians, particularly most Americans, don't really understand Asia at all. Um, and also we have to recognise that although China is interfering in different countries, the U.S. does too. 
notably through the CIA. And I think uh, my friend from Hong Kong would know that our Chinese friends think that some of the problems in Hong Kong were provoked by the CIA with undercover activities and with US non-government organizations and, and foundations getting involved. So um, I think that some of the points that uh, our Japanese friend mentioned are interesting. In terms of peace for the two areas, economic linkages uh, are important in binding the two regions together. The economic linkages provide sort of interest in, in maintaining peace. And also people to people contacts. This gets back to the education issue. You know, more and more people build contacts through education exchanges, uh, but also through immigration and through tourism. I think that can, um, you know, in Japan, you've had lots of tourists be before COVID coming from China and other parts of Asia. And through that, Japanese people are beginning to meet lots of other people they didn't before, and other people are getting to know Japan. So mutual understanding between the regions mm -hmm. uh, is very important. Tourism, migration, education are important for that. Mm -hmm. For the, the Ukraine crisis, I, I'm not quite sure what lessons we can take. I think the US has actually done a pretty good job uh, in the Ukraine situation. And that gives me a little bit of confidence. And I think China also has been a little bit cautious mm -hmm. in reacting to it. They don't like what the Russians are doing. And so I think we see a slightly more cautious China. And so mm -hmm. I think we should be less worried about China and Taiwan in the short term, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Atul, I want to ask you about the role of education in time of this, you know, uh, possible crisis. Yeah, I think uh, if you, I think education is the unifier in this, you know, many scheme of things which are kind of, you know, going all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, education is still, as I mentioned earlier, is still the forum by which the U.S. can attract talent. And I also want to touch upon, you know, you earlier mentioned what can we do to bridge the divide. You know, semiconductor is one sector which is going to be part of our lives, be it mobile phones, be it any technology, right? But why is it that the U.S. is not the biggest manufacturer of semiconductors? Why is it that they have to rely on TSMC? Why is it that Vice President Kamala Harris had to fly into Asia to see which countries can add more semiconductor capacity? Mm. But I think U.S. has got a huge land space. U.S. has got huge technology. They should be looking at, if you're talking about a comparison between China and U.S., to compete on economics or to compete on business and competitiveness. And I'm purely looking at a narrow prism of the business. I'm sure what started with President Trump would, would definitely be able to grow into a major program to attract manufacturing into the US. And there is a huge amount of high value added manufacturing that can go in there. You're not talking about manufacturing Nike shoes or, you know, or, or small cheap items. There's high value added ad manufacturing, the mm -hmm. semiconductor, and there are many such areas where you, U.S. can create their unique competitive advantage mm. and, and the business environment and the, the legal system, everything is kind of very favorable for investors to come in. So if tomorrow, if somebody wants to set up a large semiconductor factory, why doesn't U.S. roll out, you know, land parcels as China does on, on you know, 30 year free lease basis? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it give them subsidies or subs to be able to attract uh, tax subsidies, etc.? I mean, there are schemes that can be done. But you can't fight China's competitive advantage uh, in various sectors by just coming up with legislations and legislations to kind of mark them down. That's mm -hmm. not going to be uh, working in U.S. favor. So I think education brings the people in. It brings the talent in from all over the world, including Asia. Mm -hmm. So they have the people talent. They have the land mass uh, with them. So why is it that U.S. can't make it work? It's very simple. So I think education definitely is going to be the big leveler in this entire U.S. and Asia divide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, so you have uh, 30 seconds for closing comment. What's your hope for 2022, Ivan? 
Well, you know, uh, hopefully there is a, this is a year where there's a recognition that uh, ultimately uh, violence doesn't solve anything. Um, and uh, and if, uh, fostering understanding exchange is the way to go. Uh, I think uh, geopolitically, this war is making, uh, you know, a couple of uh, leaders, at least, um, uh, at least some shifts politically. You can see Republican Party uh, having some shifts. You can see China having a bit of shift as well. Uh, hopefully, these were, are the beginnings of fostering more understanding. Thank you. Shimeda-san, 30 seconds. Yes. Well, it's a kind of a simple word. I mean, the, I would like to see the 2022 will be the really peaceful one and also sustainable one as well, because there are too much, uh, the, too many things going on at the same time. The COVID-19 is still like, uh, you know, it's, it's still there. And of course, the Ukraine conflict has raises a lot of like questions and also concerns around the global issues. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, like, you know, as soon as possible, these are the wars and also the issues of the COVID-19. Uh, will be solved, and if we can just send to, to get the uh, normal days back, uh, the 2022 will be, I think, a start for a new life. So that's the, I think, my hope for this year. Okay, thank you, John. You have about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. Later this year, we have two political important political events. Mr. C hopes to be reappointed for another five years in China. Mm. I hope that once that happens, he'll start to relax and be a little bit more friendly. Uh, also, later this year, we have the midterm elections in the US. And I hope that the Democrats do better than people think because I don't want to see Mr. Trump and the Republicans come back. Hmm. Okay. Atul, your question. Yeah, I would like to see 22 as a, as a year for finding simple solutions to complex problems. Uh, you know, crisis like Ukraine could have been avoided if uh, political solutions could have been found to it. And I look forward to the leadership at United Nations uh, to, to guide us and to, to be able to find quick solutions and not let the problems deteriorate. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. The world is at a critical juncture, and I hope with wisdom and courage, somehow we will find a way to peace and stability and prosperity. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much. Thank very you. nice to meet you all, and I uh, hope to meet you live one day. Yes. Yes. Thank you, okay. Kisan, for your brilliant you. Uh, leadership. Thank you very much for your thank great you. help. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to meeting somewhere. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye.